thanks you guys for coming out. This is an awful time in the, to be up on a Sunday morning. Uh, I, I, I look at this as 3,400 hours Saturday. But, uh, okay. Okay. Good morning. Um, so, uh, I'm Matt. This is Sandy. Um, what I'm gonna, we're going to be talking about is actually joint work with a bunch of other people from uh, my lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Travis, who is here, but God knows where he is. Uh, Harry Metzger, Zach Wasserman, and uh, Kevin Zhu. Um, so, normally, uh, I don't like to start anything with a disclaimer, but in this case, I kind of have to. Um, there's a standard thing um, when you're doing work that's been supported by the federal government, they like to be acknowledged. Um, so, I should say that partial support for this work was very generously provided by the National Science Foundation, um, and we are genuinely grateful to them for the support. They also ask, uh, as part of their standard disclaimer, that I say in any presentations about their work, any opinions, findings, and conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this material are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation or the United States government. Which in this, we found to be true. Yeah, actually. in this particular case, that is true. Yeah. So, so um, uh, I am not representing the United States government here. Oh, I am definitely not. Okay. So, um, so what, I'm, uh, what we're going to be talking about is some work that we first presented last year, although I'm going to talk about stuff that we haven't talked about before. So um, uh, involving encrypted two-way radios and how they fail in practice. And, and my hope is that uh, you can understand what the problems with these particular things uh, are, but more importantly, you can understand more broadly some of the lessons we can learn from this um, in designing the next system and maybe in designing secure systems uh, more generally because I think there are some real um, general interesting problems behind this. Um, yeah, so, so in particular one-way crypto and, 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 and so on. And, and by general inter generally interesting, um, we are scientists and what we mean by that is we don't know how to do it yet. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's some work to be done. So uh, in particular the system that we've studied is called APCO Project 25, um, which sounds, it, it, it's a bit obscure. It has become the standard, though, in the US and a few other countries, including uh, Canada and Russia, uh, for digital two-way radio in narrow band frequency allocations. So it's intended to work with the existing spectrum for two-way radios that uses narrow band analog FM and be a digital drop-in replacement. So it's not a spread spectrum system. It uses the same channelized narrow slices that um, land mobile two-way radio uh, has, has always used, and it's intended to be incrementally compatible, so you can kind of move your system instead of all at once. You can do it kind of a channel at a time and some radios at a time. Um, it is intended to be one size fits all in that um, that they aim to have a standard that would be widely adopted for everything from local government, um, police dispatch, to um, uh, the radios used for tactical operations by um, intelligence and uh, federal law enforcement surveillance operatives to some use by the military in uh, battlefield and near battlefield scenarios. So everything from the two-way radio used by your local fire department for, for fire calls to um, the things at the other end of those coiled earpieces that the people in the dark suits have to actual warfighters is intended to, be, to, to use this standard or be able to use this standard. And so it includes security options that are not of interest to the vast majority of users. Local police, local fire, and so on don't need, um, don't actually even want to have their radios in general be uh, encrypted um, because they have interoperability as a major problem. But there are other users um, like people doing surveillance, um, you know, wires, um, war operations and so on that very much depend on 
uh, security. And the same standard is intended to support both the unencrypted and encrypted users. So uh, this um, uh, has been under deployment since the 1990s. A product started coming out in earnest um, around um, the early 2000s. Um, and uh, the federal government has become kind of the dominant user. So here's a typical walkie-talkie two-way um, uh, P25 radio. It's kind of the latest generation uh, of it. Uh, here's the previous generation, which has um, you know, gotten to the point that the goons here uh, can, can use them for talking um, with each other. Um, and here's, they, here's the really cool retro 1980s ha um, telephone handset yeah, version of it, which is with the same a two-way thing. radio hidden in it. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, because it's a standard, there are multiple vendors uh, in the United States. Um, Motorola is sort of the dominant vendor, particularly in the federal law enforcement uh, sector. But there are um, um, but there are uh, about a dozen. Uh, P25 vendors, uh, the user interfaces, the protocols, and to even to some extent the code base are, are pretty much standardized across vendors. This is actually an example where the standardization process has mostly worked. Usually, you know, uh, standards don't work. But here, there's at least uh, on the basic level a fair amount of actual interoperability. I went looking for, for pictures of things other than local law enforcement that are using this. Um, so I found um, a couple of pictures on the left uh, is a picture from a New York Times story about Afghanistan. If you look um, closely on the warfighter in front, uh, chest is strapped to uh, a, a Motorola XTS 5000 radio. And if you zoom in on the picture, you can see that the crypto switch is in the on position if you zoomed in really, really care, uh, closely. And you know what the on, switch on, means. And, and, you have, and you can figure out what the switch means. Um, on, the, on the right uh, is an official White House photo of the back of a Secret Service agent at a formal White House event. And you can see in stu um, stuffed in the back of her evening gown is one of these uh, radios. This is what's at the end of the coiled earpiece. If you zoom in really, really closely on this picture, you can see that the crypto switch is in the off position. Um, so, there's just a little push to talk button yeah, under her, yeah. her sleeve. And, and yeah, you'll also notice up at, at, in her sleeve is, uh, the, is the push to talk button. So that's what's at the other end of those little coiled ear pieces. Um, so the protocol is intended to, to send traffic over a narrow band voice channel, 12.5 kilohertz uh, uh, channel spacing, or 6.25 uh, kilohertz in the second version of it. Essentially, it's a 9,600 uh, bit per second. Um, uh, digital channel with voice being the dominant feature, although not the only feature, um, using a vocoder called IMB and in a later version AMB, which provides actually surprisingly good quality audio at that bit rate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's comparable to the audio quality that you get from, from narrowband FM radio, although it has different properties as it starts to uh, fail under weak signals. Um, the uh, speech is basically divided up into 180 millisecond um, um, chunks that are encoded um, with a little bit of redundant metadata and a, an er, um, error correcting codes around them. So essentially every 180 milliseconds you get a new voice frame that's uh, sent out and if you lose something within 180 milliseconds you'll catch back up. Um, actually after two of these frames, so within 360. Uh, it's a broadcast model. So these are called two-way radios, but in fact they are one-way, um, um, this is a one-way protocol in that the sender makes all the decisions. They are broadcasting to anybody uh, on the frequency. There are no handshakes. There are no, um, uh, there are no uh, sessions or any of the notions that we normally associate with a communications protocol that we might be building over something like the internet or over a, a high infrastructure system like the, the cellular telephone network. Here essentially the sender radio makes all the decisions. It's up to the receivers to re stay in receive only mode and figure out what the sender did. Um, and so it relies on forward error correction as its, uh, as its error um, correcting mechanism and also relies on the sender's security configuration to decide whether the crypto options are on. You don't negotiate with your receiver. Mm -hmm. So the security options, again, they are options. Uh, it is based entirely on symmetric crypto. There's no public key involved here at all. Um, the model is very simple. There are a bunch of standardized ciphers, most recently AES. Uh, originally, uh, they standardized on DE. 
DES, and there's still a lot of DES users out there, though not in the federal sector. Um, there are also some vendor proprietary yeah. uh, ciphers involved. Um, and we know how well they work. Right. But, uh, the, the, and uh, there's support for classified ciphers that can be kind of dropped in for, for uh, military use, although not typically for uh, federal law enforcement use, even though they often are doing classified investigations. They don't have the uh, 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 NSA crypto radios typically within the United States. Um, the traffic keys have to be loaded into the radio in advance, uh, either with a key loading device that I'll show you in a second, um, uh, or through a god-awful over-the-air rekeying protocol. Um, essentially, here are the important features of how the security model works. If you receive clear text, you always demodulate it. So on the receiving side, if you can receive clear text, you always demodulate and play it. If you receive cipher text, you check and see if you have the key material in your radio. If you do have key material in your radio, you decrypt it and play the cipher text. On the sending side, you have a switch typically configured on your radio, although it can be configured in other ways, that will switch between whether you're sending clear or sending encrypted, but that affects your outgoing traffic, not your incoming traffic. So the thing that you will notice about this protocol is it is designed to optimize communication. The thing that it is optimizing is getting the message through, which for local law enforcement, you know, where you're yelling out, I'm being shot at, please come help me, um, is exactly what you want to optimize. Um, but for other applications, this may not be what you want to optimize. You may want to be able to detect for example, that an encrypted user and a clear user are um, uh, you know, in different configurations and have it not work until they're both in agreement. But this protocol doesn't, doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, it's designed to... Um, uh, uh, oh, I got a slide for that. Yeah, so, but yeah, this one's yeah. cooler. It is cooler. One. Yeah, we have the cooler, newer one. Okay, so we, we wrote a paper. We looked at these protocols. We wrote a paper that examines in detail, and I've talked about it before, so I'm not going to repeat it here, and you can go read the paper, um, what the protocol weaknesses that we found in, uh, in, in this are. Essentially, what we found is they did not make any of the crazy mistakes that people often make when they design a crypto protocol where, you know, if you XOR the first packet with the second packet, you get the key or, yeah. you know, anything crazy like that. So, the, you know, in fact, they seem to, to do mostly the right things with the actual crypto itself. Uh, the key generation is usually based on, um, uh, the, or the IV generation is usually based on real good random numbers, as far as we can tell. Uh, they don't reuse IVs in their stream mode in any particularly obvious way, although Who's to say if they, if, you know, maybe somebody smarter than us will come along and discover that actually there is a vulnerability there. But if there are vulnerabilities, they aren't the obvious ones. But the protocols themselves are not using standard uh, designs. This was designed kind of for this and designed by a big committee. And as we all know, the larger the committee, the better the protocol you get. Um, and uh, this was designed by a large committee. Um, so there's no authentication anywhere. Um, it's incredibly susceptible to traffic analysis. Um, the unit IDs are sent in the clear even when you're in encrypted mode. There's all sorts of metadata that's uh, sent out in the clear. And we found denial of service attacks that are frightfully uh, efficient. Uh, it is much more um, uh, efficient from an energy perspective to interfere with this protocol than to use it legitimately. The, um, by, by, a, by a large factor. And there are some serious um, crypto usability deficiencies. So again, I'm not going to talk about the details of some of the active attacks that we found in the protocol, even though from a purely technical point of view, they're, 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 they're more clever um, because they require an active attacker. Um, and an active attacker at least raises the bar a little bit. Um, so, for example, there's no authentication, so a trivial active attack is that you can do impersonation um, very easily, even when you're in, you can impersonate um, uh, clear, you can use the clear mode to impersonate encrypted traffic uh, and introduce false messages or replay messages. You can do that. There's just, just no, you know, it's not no even broken, it's just not even in there. Since, since um, you can program your radio right. to, to display any ID you want, you can just become part of the group. Right. 
And, so and because it's clear, they will always receive it. Yep. Um, so the, you're subject to all sorts of um, active and passive traffic analysis. The, um, every radio has a unique identifier, typically a unique identifier. You don't have to, but in practice, anybody using the over-the-air rekeying protocol uses a globally unique identifier for every radio. The standard says you're supposed to encrypt that when you're in encrypted mode. The standard code base that all the vendors are using doesn't actually encrypt it. And we, it's not clear whether we were the first people to discover this, but we were certainly the first people apparently to mention it anywhere. Um, the, um, there, there's just a, like there's some crypto flag that's on, uh, should be on in the code that gets just isn't turned on. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but so what that means is that when people are in encrypted mode, you can get pretty good traffic analysis of who's talking. Um, but we also found some active attacks, which is that if you send, if a radio is configured to use the over-the-air rekeying protocol, which pretty much all federal law enforcement radios are, and you send them a malformed packet of a particular, with a particularly formed header, the radio will effectively see that as a ping to which it sends a NAC back. It says, oh, you sent me a malformed packet. I am user ID number 341651. Um, please send that packet again. Uh, it doesn't work for the voice protocol, but it does work for the data protocol. It's, and you can use that effectively to ping a radio at will. Yeah, and it's impossible if you're the person being pinged, unless you've got your finger in the antenna slot and you're actually feeling a little bit of heat as power goes out of your radio, there's no way to detect that you are responding. Yeah. So these, these pings are completely undetectable. Right. So, so this works for tracking radios that aren't transmitting effectively, uh, as long as they're on and within range. So we, we, uh, thanks to Margot Seltzer at Harvard, she heard about it and said, oh, you can build the Marauder's Map from Harry Potter. Um, and so essentially, you can uh, take two base stations, um, ping um, people, triangulate their location uh, with uh, phased arrays, which is pretty simple to do. In fact, there's, I, I understand there's a GNU radio project you can use an Edis box to kind of do this with incredibly cheap equipment uh, and get a real-time map of all of the users on a given frequency, even when they're supposedly idle. So is this a threat in the domestic law enforcement environment? Well, maybe, maybe not. Is it a threat in the battlefield environment? Ah, they don't care about that stuff, right? Okay. So uh, denial of service is another interesting active attack here. Um, typically with radios, uh, jamming is this, um, uh, is this fa fairly evenly matched arms race with narrowband radio. Whoever has the most power wins, so jamming requires a little more power as received at the receiver as the legitimate uh, transmitter. Um, which makes a jammer easy to find. Right. It makes a jammer easy to find and it um. makes the jammer's job at least a little bit harder or at least as hard as the job of the real communicator, and you're vulnerable to being detective. With spread spectrum systems, you can actually put the jammer at a huge disadvantage, either by using secrets or uh, some clever protocols that don't require secrets, but that would require the jammer to use significantly more energy than what they're trying to attack because they have to spread it over a wider spectrum. P25 um, manages to invert that advantage profoundly because of the way they do error uh, correcting codes. They got uh, it so wrong. Yeah. So they use error correcting codes, which is good. It makes you more resistant to dropouts. But they error correct subfields of the transmission separately, which is, it turns out, bad. So at the beginning of every 1728-bit um, voice frame, there's a 64-bit frame that contains actually about 12 bits of real information that identifies what, that this is a voice frame. If you synchronize and jam the, uh, this 12-bit um, expanded into 64-bit subframe, you can prevent the receiver from knowing what kind of frame it is and they'll ignore the rest of it. Now the effect when you do the math is that you need 14 dB less energy um, than the legitimate transmitter uh, to prevent a signal from being received because you can turn your tran jamming transmitter off for the vast, vast majority of the time. Um, so the question is, can, is it practical to build something like this? And that's why we have Travis. So um, we mentioned this problem to, uh, to, to Travis, and he said, oh, I have just the thing. Um, the P25 protocols uh, use C4FM, which is similar enough 
to a protocol used by the TI-1110 uh, uh, single-chip radio transceiver, and I can just load firmware in there to recognize the beginnings of, of the types of frames you want to jam and then turn the transmitter on. So, you know, I said, oh, great, Travis, do you think we could actually do this? And he, you know, said, well, give me an hour. And um, uh, then he, he gave us my first jammer. So this chip is used in the, um, uh, in, there's a device called the Girl Tech IME. It's either purple or pink, depending on which model you get. It has this chip in it. It's cheaper to buy these things than to buy the chips themselves. So this is actually the cheapest way to get them. They're two for $30, because uh, you want to buy them in pairs, and they have a little battery thing. And you get a keyboard and a display, and a little unicorns and ponies on the box. Um, <laughs> So you load this firmware in there and it can do all of the uh, synchronization. So we've talked about that in the past. You'd have to add an external power amplifier if you wanted to do real jamming, which would actually increase the price to, you know, uh, but, more than $15. But, so here's a scenario but, for, for you. Suppose you, you know that, that you're under surveillance and you want to block it in some way. How about building a whole bunch of these and putting a little um, ma uh, magnets on them and throwing them on the back of taxis? <laughs> So, and the other interesting scenario is can you use this to train users that their encryption doesn't work as well as the clear text? And so the interesting scenario is the selective jamming trans uh, scenario, where you don't jam everything, you just jam the ones that you can't understand yourself and force them to switch to the clear mode, which is actually trivial to program because you have to read the transmissions in order to synchronize, so you can just look and see, well, what frame type is this? Is it an encrypted frame? And then only jam those. Um, and that effectively trains the users that the thing only works if you turn the crypto switch off. Um, so, um, and I can give you examples yeah. of this. So, so again, the, the, the problem with this is that it's an active attack. And, you know, one, you know even though, okay, there's Travis and there are these uh, Girl Tech IMEs, um, you know, that's probably not a threat today. I mean, you know, give it a week or two, but uh, it's not an immediate threat. And there's still some risk because you are transmitting, and as long as you're transmitting, you know, you can, you can be detected. Right. Um, and similarly with the active ping attacks, it requires um, an adversary with a certain amount of infrastructure to do these at, uh, attacks who's willing to uh, r run the risk of actually being found. And this is going to make them very mad at you when they find you. Right. So, um, so it's actually against the law. Right. Yeah. It's not, not just against the law. It makes them mad. Right. Um, so, uh, so one kind of more interesting question, even though they're not as technically interesting, is how much? How often do they go in the clear anyway? Because of the usability and the keying problems that we found. So uh, we found a number of potential usability problems. There's four, poor feedback about the crypto state. Um, only transmit crypto is controlled by your switch, so you can't tell what state it's in by the behavior of your communication. The switch is, uh, has no effect on received audio. Um, clear signals always get ac uh, accepted when you're in encrypted mode. Encrypted signals are always accepted if you have the key material when you're in clear mode. So a clear user can happily interoperate with an encrypted user, and they just don't get any feedback about um, what's going on. Now the second thing is in the, if you look in the manuals for all these systems and what all of the users uh, and, and system administrators of these systems have been told, which is that for maximum security, change your keys. Yeah. Right? Don't we tell p users to change their passwords frequently? Right. So, so the same, same idea, well, change your, your crypto keys because, you know, if you are a, you know, if you're an agent of, you know, some federal law enforcement agency, let's pick one at random, you know, let's imagine you, you work for some bureau of the federal government that conducts investigations. I won't single any of them out. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the agents do not get captured over an enemy territory very often, but their keying practices are designed very much to make captured radios not be useful for very long. But the effect is that the over-the-air rekeying protocol has these unreliabilities built in where effectively what it does is erases your current key and then tries to get the new one. So what happens is that every time you, um, every time you rekey, people end up without keys for a little while. Um, so I'll tell you a story. Um, one thing we did in, in the, the going on three years now that we've been conducting this um, um, investigation, um, 
we have built a taxonomy of how many times we've heard them say X or Y. Um, and I cannot tell you how many times after a particular day of the month, one particular agency says, oh, fuck, the rekeying didn't work. Right. Um, but, and, and the other thing that we often hear as the first transmission that, that, we are, that, we're, that we hear in the clear is, okay, I just rekeyed. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Um, or, or somebody giving somebody else instructions on how to rekey, and then us hearing both of them. Right. So, um, so you know, if you go back to the academic literature, you could take. There was a great paper. It is required reading for everybody. Your homework after you leave this is go get Alma Witten, Doug Tigar's 1999 music paper, "Why Johnny Can't Encrypt," where they looked at PGP. And you know, and tried to figure out why people aren't using it. And you know, basically, they found a long list of usability problems for crypto protocols that you should avoid. This list was apparently used by the P25 designer as a checklist of how they should design their protocol. Because they made of all of the mistakes in Witten and Tigar's paper are, are are in there. There's no feedback to the user. The um, usability, uh, getting the uh, crypto working, isn't tied to the user experience. Um, there's little chance to notice or, um, or help. So let me just give you an example. Here's the um, a Motorola XTS 5000 radio. Here's its configuration in the clear mode. Here it is in encrypted mode. Here it is in clear mode. Here it is in encrypted mode. You can certainly see the uh, difference. The and difference is... Then if we go back yeah. a sec uh, um, to our original picture yeah. of... Yeah, we, we zoomed in on these pictures. And look pictures. where the radios are. How are they going to tell anyway? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah. So um, th th that's the indication. Now, you can also get a beep um, to be configured if you're in clear mode. There's a crypto beep warning, but it's also you it's the same beep as the channel is available beep in, when it's in the trunk signals and the low battery beep um, when it's uh, so um, often, you know, people just start changing their batteries constantly to get rid of the beep um, and it's, <laughs> they're in the encrypted mode. Um, the, um, the 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 trick is there's this little symbol, a zero means one state and a zero with a slash through it means the other state. Can there is disagreement among the user community about which means which. Uh, so, so, so uh, back up to here. Yeah. Okay, what does that mean to you? To me, this, it means no, doesn't it? It means don't touch this. It, it means, means bad yeah. kitty, you're going to get smacked. Yeah, actually, um, it means to me air conditioning vent closed. Right. right. Um, fee, it, yeah. it, um, if you're into group theory. Um, the null set. Yeah. It means goes to, to, um, to quiet if you're um, into, um, into language stuff. Right. Um, so they have um, these, yeah, so, so it's also, um, uh, you know, it means either open or closed is apparently the metaphor that you're supposed to understand that symbol with. Um, so we made up hats that we've been giving out and to shirts. feds and, 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 and shirts, you know, with the encrypt, you know, when I put this hat on, you can't understand, blah, 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 word I'm saying, yeah. okay. Um, um, we, have a, we have a few of these for swag for good questions. Yeah. So um, one of the problems is that keys are set to either expire or be rigorously enforced because changing your keys is good. That causes people to go in the clear, though. There's no way to rekey the radios in the field. Even mm -hmm. though there's a keypad on the radio, you can't actually use that to enter a key. You have to either use the um, over-the-air rekeying protocol or a key loading device. Um, here's the latest and greatest version that will load AES keys in it. Um, you're told, keep this in your safe. Don't let this out in the field because it has keys in it. Um, and so, uh, you know, people who are conducting a surveillance operation and so on don't have any chance of, of, of fixing a problem, even if they detect it. And they're ridiculously expensive, so yeah. every group Everything only has one. Everything here is ridiculously one. expensive, um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, these are government um, prices. And they require that you punch in about 64 buttons without making a mistake. No. And if you make a mistake, you have to start over. So, you know, the, the active attacks are interesting, but the, you know, the, they're probably, we, we found no evidence that the active attacks are actually being conducted by bad guys. We were interested, though, in the question of, well, how often do these passive problems result in unintended clear text? And besides that, we're lazy and passive attacks are much easier. Right. Um, the, um, so Bob Morris, who was a, a technical director at the National Security Agency, gave a public talk at the Crypto 95 conference. He repeated a version of that talk here a couple of years later, but the first time he gave it was at the Crypto 95 conference, a gathering of cryptographers in Santa Barbara every August. He got, we got him to give the keynote address, and he revealed 
the NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis, and we all got out our pens and papers and wrote it down because we thought we were going to be told something about, well, you use Gauss's formula here and do this. Well, what he said was, NSA rule number one of cryptanalysis, look for clear text. So <laughs> we decided to actually do that. Um, so. In, in our lab, we, we, when we started playing with these, we got some of these radios, we inadvertently misconfigured one, and we got the frequency that we were trying to enter into it off by like 10 megahertz or something like that by entering the digits wrong, and suddenly we start hearing this really interesting sounding surveillance operation. Um, and, and they were actually in the neighborhood of the university, and they were talking in kind of, uh, you know, a fed speak, and uh, it, it sounded, it was like having our own private version of the wire. It was really interesting. Um, and they clearly were referring to being in encrypted mode. And that was really surprising. So we decided to collect some statistics about how often this happened. So we wanted to focus on confidential federal law enforcement traffic. So we omitted local agencies, non-covert operations. Um, you know, the National Park Service uses these radios. We didn't care about them. No offense to anyone from the National Park Service. Um, so we, we were focusing only on the uh, federal law enforcement that was doing confidential surveillance operations. And we wanted to see, well, how often are they actually going out in the clear? So we wanted to be very systematic about this. So it's easy to pick up unintended clear federal traffic. In fact, scanner really hobbyists easy. do this all the time. But we're scientists, and we overdo things. Um, and, and besides, we, it lets us get all really cool equipment to play with. It, it, well, <laughs> it's, it's true. But um, so we wanted to ask, well, really systematically, how big a problem is this actually? How often does this happen? Are these usability problems actually, do these actually represent a serious problem? And we wanted to get data rather than anecdotes of, hey, we hear the feds from time to time. So we decided that the best thing to do would be to build our own little SIGINT network, um, you know, uh, and uh, collect P20, clear P25 content and the metadata in several cities, just like we were if we were a hostile intelligence service trying to find out what's going on uh, and, and do this seriously. So please understand, um, there, there was a really good paper at RuxCon in Australia a year or two ago where they looked at, at the P25 radios and DES encryption. And of course, everyone knows DES is broken, and they showed um, how it's broken on these radios as well. We did not bother to look at the crypto. Um, if AES was broken, we have other problems besides these radios. Um, and we didn't have to. And right. why should you do any more work than, we, than, you, didn't, than you have to do? Right. We were just looking at clear text. Right. And even though we have Travis with camera, we don't want to use it. Right. right. We, we, Not outside of the right. lab. Anyway. Right. We don't, want to, we don't want to actually cause them any more harm than they've already got. Right. Because, the, you know, the, the, just the pure passive attacks are uh, bad enough or we wanted to find out at least yeah. how bad are they. So one problem is we wanted to build our own little NSA on the cheap, but we do not actually have the NSA's budget. Um, you know, we, um, uh, you know, so how do we do this? So we got off the shelf equipment. First we started, we wanted to use Edis boxes running GNU radio because they are cool. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're not quite able to do well, real time uh, IMBE decoding with the current versions of the software. They, for they it. may be now, when we started three years ago, um, that it wasn't um, mature yet, but it, a, it, a lot of things have been done, and we've been, we're looking at it for the follow-up paper that we're going to be doing on the over there keying. Yeah. Um, so they may be yeah. useful for that. Yeah. So, so we um, ended up not getting so cool software to find radios uh, for our SIGIN operation. We instead used uh, purpose-built software controllable radios. We ended up getting the ICOM R2500s, which are aimed at the um, hobbyist scanner market, but the interesting thing is there's a P25 option board that does pretty good quality decoding of the P25 audio. Um, so what did we do? Well, there are 2,000 roughly channels on, in VHF and UHF that are allocated to the federal government, about 20, 24 megahertz of spectrum. Um, law enforcement is mixed in with unsensitive stuff, and some of the frequencies they're using are well known. Some of them are not. There's a website called radioreference.com, which is mostly nonfiction, but contains <laughs> yeah. a lot of fiction. Um, so we decided to just ignore it and uh, used a slightly different approach for uh, identifying which channels have in, uh, the sensitive traffic on it. How did we identify which channels have sensitive traffic on it? They're the ones with encryption. So we found the, the frequencies with encrypted traffic on it, 
and we um, basically identified candidate frequencies for sensitive stuff as what those were. And then we deployed a network of these uh, R2500 receivers running so uh, tethered to computers running software that we built to collect data in a systematically and analyzable way uh, in a variety of unnamed cities that we cannot tell you the identity of so um, because we don't want to actually um, be rated. <laughs> well, we don't want to. We don't want to reveal um, information about who is sensitive, uh, who is vulnerable to this. Right. Although everyone is vulnerable, we know that they are vulnerable in certain cities that we are not actually allowed to tell you because of our uh, institutional review board rules about human subject data. So, uh, so, so use your imagination about what cities. And might so, be so to recap, the, the equipment you need is one radio capable of doing P25, and they're fairly inexpensive. About um, a thousand bucks, yeah. uh, with the plus, a, you know, including a netbook computer. Yeah, uh, one you know. netbook and a little bit of really crappy C code. Yeah, um. Um, and we're going to release our crappy C code yeah. um, uh, uh, probably over the next few weeks. Right now, we can't do it out of fear of embarrassment. Yeah, but we're um, we're working on unembarrassed. We'll clean it up and make it it's, look actually. It's, it is research grade it, software. It's right gradware. Now. Yeah. Um, so uh, research grade, yes. Um, mm -hmm. So what did we do? Well, we collected all of the clear text audio and metadata and all of the metadata um, on these uh, channels. And what we found was that, in fact, most traffic is successfully encrypted. But about 30 minutes per day per city of traffic isn't encrypted. Now, there's high variance. It turns out there's a, this happens much more often um, during the normal work week than on weekends. Um, the, um, it happens much more often on uh, the, the week after Reiki day than it does before. Yes. Um, when there's a, the larger the operation, the higher probability that there's some in, uh, sensitive clear text uh, mm -hmm. going on. So what did we capture? Well, we got occasional sensitive clear content and a lot of metadata. Because we, the metadata is in the clear even on the encrypted traffic. Yeah, um, yeah we never found a case, never, yeah. where the yeah, metadata is Nobody was makes Not equipment once. that gets it right where they encrypt mm -hmm. the metadata. Um, and then we discovered that actually doing this systematically is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Traffic analysis, when you actually go to the trouble of collecting the data as opposed to just poking around and seeing what you're hearing, um, it allows you to take the stuff that you've gotten in the clear, which is only a tiny percentage of it, and use that to make really good inferences about what's going on in encrypted mode. And you know, there have been books written about this. The Zendian problem book is sort of the classic text on this. This was an NSA course in traffic analysis, where you get a little encrypted traffic and a lot of uh, traffic you can't uh, decrypt, uh, and you're supposed to make inferences about what's going on. That stuff works. Um, so you essentially can can find out um, by looking at all of the metadata, you learn, well, what user IDs are associated with what agencies. Mm -hmm. um, we discovered that one agency that we will not identify, um, ha we found a list of offices of this agency, mm -hmm. and, and each office of this agency was numbered. We found out that number was embedded in the user IDs that they have, so we can find out which office is actually doing yep. an operation by looking at their IDs. And since and then, they sometimes list the employees of various offices, right. then you find out who. Yeah. Um, um, so um, you can use, the, when they go out in the clear, you learn a little bit who are their names, what are the, some of the operations that are going on. The best phrase to listen for is, okay, everyone, here's the plan. <laughs> um, the, um, how sensitive is sensitive? So what we found included actually some of the most sensitive investigative data that the government handles. Um, you know, they talk Because they believe this is encrypted, they are much more um, direct about what's going on. They're not circumspect anymore. They don't speak in coded languages. It's not Agent 25, we're at location B. It's, you know, hey, well, Fred. One, well, one, yeah. one yeah. group um, actually does use Agent, and yeah. uh, we can tell you which agency it is. We can tell you which agency it is by their banter. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's got their own particular culture, and after listening for, for just a few minutes, you know who it is. And some of these guys are, you know, are, are really jokey, some are really silly, some things that go across the air are downright embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Can I tell yeah, you I'll one tell story? Yeah, the open mic stories um, are great. Yeah. Okay, oh. so one time, one um, agent had um, her microphone open while she was on the telephone arguing with her spouse about 
who ruined whose sister's wedding. Um, and, and, and it went on for a long, a long time. time. Apparently that agency didn't have the timeout timer configured on their yeah. uh, um, radios. Um, but, you know, that, so that's sort of funny and, and embarrassing. But we also are getting things like, you know, the name of the confidential informant. Whether or not there's a helicopter, what cars they're in, their tag numbers. Um, who they're following, what the person's following. Uh, we can give you some great tips on how to avoid surveillance. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's kind of like looking at their cards. Yeah. We, um, so you know, mostly this is not um, classified traffic, but um, there are occasional um, uh, protective details for you know certain high-level executives of the federal government. Um, uh, some counterterrorism, some counterintelligence traffic. Uh, you know, it, everybody is vulnerable to this. It doesn't matter what you're doing, unless you're in one particular agency that we cannot identify that does not ever go in the clear. And anybody, uh, does anybody want to take a guess for a hat? Yep. Can anybody tell us? You get one guess, so make it good. Who does not? You, Thank sir. You no, no, nope, no, 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 no. One more we guess. We got them. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. Not no, them either. Nope. Um, no, what? you guessed no. already. You have to sit down. Somebody else is turning. Right. Oh, well, you were wrong right? anyway. <laughs> what? Nope. Nope. Yeah. What? No, nope. no, no, no. Yeah. All right, one last oh, guess. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, sorry. One last guess. U.S. Yes, yes, nope, nope. Not Secret Service, not Coast Guard. No. Um, anyway, yep, yeah, nobody ever guesses. Catch us in the ready room at, or in the yeah. Q&A afterwards. Energy? No. No? No. Somebody got it. But somebody, somebody who, got who, it. Who, who said Postal Service? Postal. Come on up. <laughs> um, yeah. do, do not mess with the postal inspector. Um, <laughs> They are everywhere, and they're so, invisible. On the flip side of how funny or boring some of the stuff we've heard is, um, some of it has been scarily um, sensitive. And one thing that we have learned from listening to, the, to these people, what, whatever your um, belief about whether or not the, the um, laws that they are, tr are trying to um, enforce are good laws or bad laws, um, the people are, are doing their jobs. And they are very, very good at, and very professional at doing their jobs. But damn it, they can't use the equipment right. And, that, and, be, and they can't use it right because, they, because it's designed in ways that make it difficult to use. Um, one of our people working on this hadn't been playing with the radios for about three months, came back and couldn't remember which way the crypto switch went. Um, and um, being a, uh, using these wrong puts these people's lives in danger. And one, one thing that we, that we caught a lot of was trying to rescue victims of human trafficking. Um, and that's a fairly dangerous position to put in. And I'd like them to su succeed at that without their radios blowing their cover. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, you know, the question is, well, what did we do? Well, we, before we published at, um, the, the first of our results, you know, we, we naturally wanted to kind of mitigate some of the harm. I mean, we had sort of one temptation was to go and become master criminals. Um, but um, we, we, we rejected that option, for the record. Um, so we, we, we also realized that the passive attacks, although some of them are sort of embedded in the standard, can, can be mitigated with um, better configuration and, and better procedures. So we did reach out to the user community. Mm -hmm. And the active attacks um, are long-term problems that require fixing to the standards, so we also reached out to the, to the standards community. So one question is, well, you know, who um, would react better? Um, so th in the short term, we approached the feds. Um, we very politely went to various levels of the different agencies that are having some of these problems, both from their headquarters levels to the local like field offices. I, five, yep, got it. Um, uh, to the uh, local field offices, and in fact, you know, one of the things we were worried was that we would leave these meetings in handcuffs. But in fact, uh, they they understood. Then it'd be all his fault. Yeah, uh, I was so led astray. I, you know, uh, you know, in fact, um, they were actually receptive and appreciative universally at all levels. Yes. Um, you know, uh, but they really got it. They really yeah. got it, and we've had these very satisfying meetings, and you know, I, uh, you know, with the right phone numbers to call. And every time we would have one of these meetings with an agency, we would see their unintended clear text drop really rapidly, and then go up to past where it was before after about a week. 
And so um, there's something where paying attention to the problem causes it to become worse. We, we don't understand um, this. Which we, we do not fully understand. In the longer term, uh, we've got to fix the protocols and the standards, and that's going to require the vendors and the standards body, the P25, to actually take a good hard look at it. Because yeah, so, it's obvious, for one thing, that they didn't include um, people like us, people whose, whose research is the security of communications protocols in the design of these. And then when they implemented, it's obvious that they didn't include people like us, people who, professional and amateur penetration testers, um, to look at this. So they had no idea whether it works or not, but then they went ahead and implemented it and sold millions of them. So, so the least pleasant four hours of my life were at the P25 standards uh, body. There's a microphone, by the way, up here. Uh, uh, at the P25 standards body, where they spent the first three hours of the meeting explaining all of the different ways in which I'm an idiot. Uh, and then all of the vendors pretty well agreed that they're, all of the protocols and products are just fine, and the problem is the users. And so, um, so you, you know, you'll argue with them and you'll say, not being able to, to rekey in the field yeah. is a problem. What if you have to add a different group and you don't have a key loader? Yeah. Um, but finally, the, the only argument we could make is, you know, it doesn't matter whether the problem is the users. You can't fix the users, so fix the usability. Right. So the, um, the, the uh, much finger pointing and enjoyment, so I got many more entries for my security excuse bingo as a result of this, uh, um, uh, 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 as, as a result of this. Um, um, I am writing an iPhone app for this. It will be released publicly, so you... So okay, so if we you have, want to play this, it'll be we, have, we have time for like you know 0.25 questions, um, and then we'll have the Q and A room later. So, sir. Okay, so 0.25 questions. Um, would you say that? What? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what you described, where you notified law enforcement, and the amount of uh, basically the amount of clear, unintended clear traffic went down and then went back up. Right. Uh, to me, that speaks of they changed the policy. And then immediately it became the fact that the new policy got in the way of doing things, so people subverted it. Um, yes. I, that, that's possible. And I think that's, a very, yeah. that's, that's very probable. Yeah. So, so um. what I would ask is um, how much insight have you been able to gain? Pro and I don't know whether this would be, could have been your interaction with law enforcement, could have been basically from reading the manuals and knowing how these things have to happen. How much insight did you gain into what sort of the obvious choices for policies and procedures around this would be. And do, yeah. do you have any suggestions so or we, any insights? Yeah, so we, we actually have a mitigation guide that's, that, as far as we can tell, has not actually been implemented yet within yeah. the federal sector. So the, the immediate term problem was telling people, you know, what they did was they told people, pay more attention to this, make sure the yeah. switch is in this position. And then they remember that for a week. After a week, what they remember is fiddle with the switches. Right. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we're, we're, we're right Almost up at the hook. end, so speak quickly until we get the hook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the question is uh, on the jitters radio, that's uh, the government standard. Mm -hmm. Uh, how does it compare to the P25, and is there any other cross volume uh, that we should it's, worry it's, about? Yeah, it's got a it, it's got a completely different set of of of, of uh, issues. Problems. That that it does not share any of the problems with this, and has its own set of problems. Right. Yeah. And last one. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, oh, real quick. Yeah. 